Okay, now we're recording. Um, I can go back and refilm over this. But this is what we're going to sort of go over as far as the structure. So this is the leadership in each chamber, right? So you've got the Senate. The president there is Warren Peterson. You'll hear a lot about him in the news, as well as Speaker Ben Toma in the House of Representatives. Those two positions, they're in theory elected by all the electeds in their chamber, but in practice, it's typically whatever political party holds the majority is going to elect somebody from their party. The rest of these positions, the majority leaders, minority leaders, the whips, those are party elected, party specific leadership roles. So that's the difference there is the president of the Senate and the, the speaker as well as the pro tempores, those are in the structure, right, of the House and the Senate, but these other positions, they're very party specific. So for example, Andres Cano doesn't get a say, Andresa Martinez being the majority whip and vice versa, party specific. The Senate president and the House speaker are very powerful people. As you'll see, as we walk through how a bill becomes a law, they hold a lot, a lot of power. They run their chambers, they set for actions. They are the ones that assign bills to committee or decide not to sign bills to committee. So they're super powerful folks. Um, and TJ Shope and Travis Grantham, they're pro tempores, which basically means, you know, in the Senate president's absence or the speaker's absence, they step up and fulfill that role. They're sort of like the vice presidents. And the majority of minority leaders, um, there's one for each party. The minority leader is currently the leader of the Democratic Party, majority leader is the leader of the Republican Party given that Republicans have more numbers than Democrats. So those are the folks that help guide each party's caucus. And the whips, those are the folks that are responsible for knowing their members vote count. So before things ever get to the floor, the whips know, right, for their party, who's voting yes, who's voting no. So I see you have a question, is the assistant whip Democratic Party specific or always with the minority party? The system whip. Can you rephrase the, the question? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I just noticed there wasn't an assistant uh, oh. majority leader. And maybe that's just, because it wasn't included on the thing. And so it might not be important. I was just curious as mm -hmm. to why it was different, whether it was the Democratic Party or just something that the minority always had. Got it. I see what you mean. That's a that's just a preference of the party of whether they want an assistant whip or, or not. So the majority party could have an assistant whip. The minority party can decide they just want the minority whip. I think that's that's just purely up to the party. That's a great question though. Thank you. And then committees. So the Senate has um, appropriations, commerce, education, ethics, finance, government, health and human services, judiciary, natural resources, energy and water, rules, transportation, and technology. And the House of Representatives mirrors a lot of these, but has a few additional um, and different committees, but basically, you know, the, the president and the speaker leadership and the parties decides who gets to sit and chair these committees and the majority party stacks these committees in a way that the majority party is the majority in each of these committees, if that makes sense. And then this is the party composition of our um, legislature at this point. So as you can see, there's 30 seats in the Senate, 60 seats in the House, right, to reflect that one senator and two representatives from each district. You'll see that we have 16 Republicans in the Senate, 14 Democrats, and in the House, 
31 seats are with Republicans and 29 seats are with Democrats. So those are very slim differences, right? It's a very slim majority for Republicans and a very slim minority for Democrats. Um, and just to emphasize, you know, sort of just the reality that we're in right now. Um, on the side here, you'll see the breakdown between the Senate and House over the years. So over two decades ago, uh, once upon a time, there was parity in the Senate with a 15-15 tie, but otherwise that's never happened um, in the past 25 years or so. And a question here, will you go over what happens with independence? So I'm not sure actually if we've ever had an elected independent, um, but if you wanna send me some specific, specific questions you might have, Sophia, I can do a bit of research and, and get back to you um, outside of the training. All right, so how does a bill become a law? So this is the part that's gonna get a little more wordy, a little more wonky. Um, tried to pare this down a bit, but again, you'll notice things like we're not talking about strikers and the plethora of things that can just happen during a legislative session. So if you have any questions, please write them down. And in our 102, 201 trainings, we'll see what we can work in to, to build off of this training. So how does a bill become a law? Step one, a bill is filed. So when a bill gets a sponsor, right, whatever, wherever it originates, like say you have a senator that is the first person to sponsor a bill, that's where it's gonna originate. So that's gonna be the chamber of origin. That's how you'll hear people refer to it. So once that sponsor files the bill in the Senate, they file it with the secretary in the House of Reps, they'll file it with the chief clerk. It gets assigned a bill number. <clears throat> so oftentimes you'll see SB, which just means Senate Bill 1001, or House Bill 2001, which would be HB. But Senate bills will always start with a one, and House bills will always start with a two. Step two, it'll go through a first reading and committee assignment. So the way we're gonna walk through how a bill goes through here is, I'm gonna say Senate president or house speaker, but I want you to think of it through the viewpoint of like, this is the chamber of origin, right? So like SB 1001 has been filed and now we're gonna walk through what it looks like for it to go through one chamber. So, First reading and committee assignment. So if it originates in the Senate, the Senate president, or if it originates in the House, the House Speaker will sign the bill to be first read in its chamber of origin. So once that happens, the Senate president or House Speaker can then assign it to a standing committee. And each bill has to pass through at least one standing committee in order to make it to the next, state, next stage. However, leadership can make this much more difficult by either not assigning it at all, right? They just kill it on the spot or they can assign it to multiple committees. So sure, they'll assign it, but it gets assigned to three committees. So now you've got all this extra lobbying that you have to do. So, you know, say the Senate president goes ahead, signs it to a committee, doesn't kill it by withholding it from ever being assigned. Then the chair, which is also a very powerful person, the chair of the committee to which it's assigned, then they get to decide whether and when the bill is heard in committee. So they can also just decide to kill it at that point. And each of those chairs who's appointed, um, you know, it's just an additional hurdle. And mind you, remember that it can be assigned to multiple committees. So say, you know, Two of the, it gets assigned to three committees, two chairs go ahead and hear it, the third one can just decide, I'm gonna kill it. 
Most of these standing committees have weekly hearings at which the public can comment, um, including via the request to speak system that we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, bills must pass, must pass each committee to which they are assigned with a simple majority vote. And any of the lawmakers on the committee can propose amendments as well. Um, those just also have to pass by a simple majority vote on the committee. After its committee hearing or hearings, the bill is then heard by the Rules Committee, whose job is to verify that the bill is constitutional and drafted in the proper format. It cannot be amended at that stage in rules. And again, we'll talk about requests to speak later. But typically, if you're going to use that system, you want to use that in these other committees, right? If it's in Ways and Means or Education or Government Elections, that's where you want to use Request to Speak. You don't want to use it in, during the Rules Committee stage, since that's not about the merits of, of the bill. That's typically just about, you know, that it's drafted correctly and is in violation of the Constitution. Step three or four is uh, it goes to caucus. So basically this is where the lawmakers in the chamber of origin divide by party to discuss the bill. There's no formal vote held here. It's simply an opportunity behind closed doors for each party to reach consensus on the bill, right? We're against this, we're for this. Maybe, you know, there's a couple people that are feeling conflicted and it's just an opportunity for folks to to work things out and talk strategy and get on the same page. So then what that once that happens, um, it goes to a four vote, right? So gets out of committee, passes rules, it's constitutional, it's drafted properly. Then the Senate president, House Speaker and the Bill's Chamber of Origin can decide whether and when they want to schedule that bill for a vote by the entire chamber. So this is another opportunity where the speaker or the president can decide that they want to kill the bill, even if it's passed through committee. So if any lawmaker wishes to debate or amend the bill, it goes to something called committee of the whole. Sometimes you'll see that abbreviated just as cow. Um, and it's a term for all lawmakers in that chamber that are debating the bill, deciding whether they want to adopt any proposed amendments. And then after this step, the bill will receive a formal four vote, four vote um, or what's called a third read. And then finally, so say your chamber of origin is the Senate and the bill goes through all of that, manages not to get killed, then it has to go to the House of Reps or vice versa, right? Then you repeat all those steps, it's gotta get, assigned to committee, it's got to get out of committee, then the leadership of the, the chamber that you're in needs to decide to take it to a four vote, um, and then it has to have those votes, right? So there's a chamber crossover there, both sides have to agree on the very same bill. So once a bill has passed the crossover chamber, it's then sent back to the Chamber of Origin, which then has to send it to the governor for a signature or a veto. Any bill that isn't amended in the crossover chamber goes directly to the governor. However, again, say your bill originated in the Senate, but then it went to the House and the House said, well, we didn't really like this thing, so we made this amendment. Then it's gotta go back to the Senate and the Senate needs to say, okay, we agree with this amended version. Once everything passes, then it can be transmitted to the governor. However, if it doesn't pass a final read, differences between the chambers will need to be resolved in a what's called a conference committee and then be transmitted to the governor. However, if both sides can't come to an agreement or compromise in conference committee, it doesn't go to the governor. All right, now the this bill that we've been dreaming of, it's gone through it all, gone through both chambers. Maybe it got amended and it went to a conference committee. Legislators worked it out and it's finally, it's to the governor. So if the governor signs the bill, it becomes law 90 days after the end of legislative session. 
but a bill can also become law without the governor's signature. And this happens automatically if a bill is not signed within five days while session is underway or within 10 days after session has ended. And sometimes why that might happen is for political reasons. If the governor vetoes a bill, this prevents it from becoming law, but the legislature can come back and override a veto with a two thirds majority vote. Before we move on to request to speak, any questions on, on these previous eight steps that we covered? It's a lot of information. I see a hand raised, go ahead. Hi, so with the governor um, choosing not to veto something but not sign it either, is that just a political move like, oh, I don't wanna necessarily kill it but I'm not showing my support for it and, but I know it's gonna go through and become law? So, there could be a variety of reasons. I know Ducey had done this at some point. I need to find what bill that was, but sometimes it can be they don't want to like publicly <laughs> show like I fully support this bill. Sometimes it might be some hard feelings with, you know, whatever groups or legislators might have been involved with mm -hmm. passing. There's just a lot of political reasons um, mm -hmm. that they might decide not to put their signature on it. Um, but also don't want to veto it either. Okay, thank you. All right, so what is request to speak? So again, this is something that you might see a lot of, um, especially the RTS, sign up for RTS. Do you need RTS? Um, and what it is, it's, it's a program provided by the state legislature that allows the public to register their opinions on bills that, you know, when you log in and you see the agenda, you can click on, on it and say, this is how I feel about this bill. Um, so you can request to speak on a bill once it's in a committee. Um, after the initial setup, so you can go online, um, but however your first time setting it up, you have to go down to the Capitol and, you know, at a kiosk, register for the RTS program, and then you can participate remotely. Um, but before anyone, you know, starts, you know, thinking about when they're going to go down, there's a workaround to this um, that we're going to go over here in a minute. Um, but basically, when the committee is in session, the committee members and the public will see a list of names of people who have registered an opinion on a bill, um, who you're representing, you know, if anyone, you can also just represent yourself, um, as well as like comments that you can leave. And sometimes legislators will read these out loud in committee. And this information is also available if a person searches past committee agendas. So you can pick a bill in this program and go see like, who's for and against it. And you can also say like, you know, I dislike this bill because X, Y, Z. And legislators can see that. So how do you get set up with request to speak? There's this wonderful organization called Civic Engagement Beyond Voting. They're an indivisible group. They have a ton of resources on their site, um, which is that website right there, the www.cebv.us. They have training videos. They will do individualized training for your orgs. Um, they will help prepare talking points for folks. They're just beyond amazing. Um, so what you can do is you can go to that link that I put there, or you can scan that code. And what that QR code, uh, where it'll take you is a, a Google Doc form. And if you fill out that form, what happens is they will have a volunteer go on your behalf down to the Capitol. They will register you at the kiosk and then they will email you with your login information and next steps. So if you're unable to make it to the legislature, the legislature, 
you know, due to time constraints, accessibility, you live outside of Maricopa County, these are the folks you want to go to, register through them, they will get you set up. Any questions on request to speak before we move through the next section? I have a question. Um, hi, Ariel, it's Tanya. Hey, Tanya. <laughs> I wanted to know, for request to speak, do you have to be a citizen or a voter? Like, can anyone go to request to speak? So I maybe, I know there's an option in there where it asks you if you're a voter, but I'm not 100% on the answer to that. Is there anyone here that knows for sure? I know that you can be under 18. So for yeah. students and kids, um, not so much I, I'm pretty sure you can also not be a voter. Don't quote me on that part, but you can be under 18. So for students who want to share stuff, because especially like education bills and so many things affect them, they can use request to speak. Yeah. I will find an answer to that and I'll include it in, um, I'm currently creating a toolkit um, that will have all these resources for you on how to get set up with request to speak, manual guides, all the ins and outs of how a bill becomes law, the like 401 version of this. Um, and that's a great question. I can conclude, you know, whether or not that, you know, you do or don't have to be a voter or you can be under 18 and all those, those things. It's a great question. Thank you. All right, so for our next section, I'd love to introduce you all to, yes, Devin, thank you. Anyone can use it. This is actually a great segue. Devin Del Palacio is our special guest today. Um, he's a former state rep, and I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about him, and then we're gonna kick it over to him for some Q&A. Um, so Devin is a lifelong resident of Arizona, and he's dedicated himself to empowering and serving his community. Growing up, Devin was raised by a single mother and taught the value of hard work at a young age. Despite facing financial challenges, Devin excelled academically and went on to attend eight different public schools. Determined to give back to his community, Devin began work as a community organizer in 2012. Through his efforts, he successfully registered 34,000 minority voters in South and West Phoenix. Seeking to make an even greater impact, Devin ran for a seat on the Tullison Union High School District Governing Board in 2014. He won a seat on the board, becoming the first African-American to serve on the board in the district's 100-year history, and immediately took office as vice president. In 2017, Devin was recognized by the Greater Phoenix Urban League as one of their top 40 under 40 in public service. In addition, he has been recognized by the Cesar Chavez Foundation, the City of Phoenix, NASA JPL and the Arizona School Board Association for his commitment to creating equitable schools and safe neighborhoods through his collaborative efforts. Devin has also taken a national leadership role with the National School Board Association, serving as chairman for the National Black Council of School Board members. In 2022, he was appointed to serve in the Arizona State of House, Arizona State House of Representatives, where he worked to create positive change in his community. So a warm welcome to Devin. And I have a couple of questions for Devin and then we will kick it off to the audience um, to, to ask him you know, about his experience, what the legislature is like, all that good stuff. Um, so Devin, the first thing I wanna ask you is what inspired you to get involved at the legislature? Awesome. Well, first of all, Ariel, thank you again for having me. And thank you to Instituto uh, for bringing these conversations forward. You know, this knowledge isn't necessarily taught uh, as it should be in our K-12 system. And so, like they say, you don't know what you don't know. 
So I'm glad you guys are doing this and providing this opportunity for everyone to learn. Um, before I answer the question, obviously, I need to give a shout out to Danya, who uh, is class of 2010 from La Jolla in my district in Tolleson. And then also I see a bunch of awesome community organizers, community leaders who are in this call, some who I've worked with personally from back in the day. I see my boy Dom and other people. So it's good to be amongst a good crowd. Um, so what inspired me to run? Um, really, my why was my daughter. Um, in 2012, actually in 2010, when I found out I was going to become a father, I asked myself a simple question. Will my daughter, this beautiful young girl color, have access to an equitable education in Arizona? Will she be judged by who she is and not off her looks? And I couldn't answer that question. I couldn't answer that question. I said, look, I have to get involved. I got to get involved. Um, and I did. I did like any other millennial would do and hopped on Google and literally looked up how to volunteer, how to get involved because I wasn't taught that growing up. Politics wasn't a conversation I had around a dinner table. You see, um, my mom had me at a very young age when she was just 16 years old. So her priority were, was ensuring that we had lights on and food on the table, not necessarily what Bill Clinton was doing or not doing. And I feel that a lot of our community are in that same position where they're in survival mode. And so oftentimes when we talk to them about voting or civic engagement, they're like, what's the point? But we need to change that narrative because it does matter, right? And if it didn't matter, folks wouldn't be uh, passing laws to make it more difficult for people to vote. So, but um, really uh, what, what inspired me to run was my daughter. And um, she continue, her and her sister continue to serve as my why. You know, I truly believe that everything we do is for the next generation. And we have a responsibility, a responsibility to make this place better than what we found in it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that, Devin. So when you were appointed, um, you were actually the only Black legislator that we had at the legislature at the time. And now that you're no longer there, what does that mean for our state and Black communities? Well, I'll tell you this. I'm very disappointed. I'm disappointed at the lack of representation. I'm disappointed that those life experiences from the African American community will not be, uh, will not have a seat at the table, and so that that that's frustrating. Um, now I will say that there is an African American gentleman. Uh, his name is David Marshall. He is currently serving in the House. Um, he is a Republican. Uh, he's a Trump MAGA Republican. Spoke at the Trump rally, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not too sure what type of life experience he will bring to the table that's inclusive um, and speaks to the majority of people from my community and their needs. Um, but look, it's always hard just being the only one, no matter what line of work you're in, be it politics, business, you name it. Um, and my hope is that one day, one day when my daughters are grown and maybe one day when they have kids that we no longer have first because we would have already achieved true inclusion. And so, um, but it was difficult, um, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, there, there is no tribe for you to connect with. So without having that support to lean on, it does get tough. Uh, and the pressures of being the only one sometimes are, are heavy. You know, you try to carry and you try to represent the best of your ability. And sometimes no matter what you do, um, and that's with anything, you're never gonna please everybody. Uh, so, uh, sometimes carrying the weight of being the only one, uh, you know, it, it, it did get stressful. Even beyond that, even as a school board member, um, there's not many of us on the school board. Um, and it gets heavy there. You know, it gets heavy there because all of a sudden you feel that you're speaking on behalf of the entire uh, community. Even though our community is not a monolith, right? We don't necessarily agree on everything. But that, those are the pressures that um, specifically... Uh, black electeds feel here in Arizona because there are so few of us there. But I do think it's, I do think it's, um, I'm, I'm heartbroken, I'm disappointed that um, we don't have more representation at the state level when there's millions of African Americans um, that live here. And specifically in my district, so in the district that I was in, LD19, which is now 22, they have the fastest growing population of black folks. Um, next to South Phoenix. So that was really disheartening. Um, but again, we have to engage people. 
Uh, we have to talk to folks. We can't just come around during election time. You would have to remain consistent and steady in front of them all the time. So that way folks can, can feel like they have a reason to vote and they have someone that's gonna represent their interest. Um, and then we also have to do another, we also have to do a better job at finding good candidates that are, that are gonna bring folks out to vote. So um, there's just so, many, so much there that, to, to unpack. But to answer your question, how did it feel? Um, it was a lot. Um, obviously, it, you know, it was an honor to be there, an honor to serve. But <clears throat> the fact that we only get away with having one or two is ridiculous. It's completely unacceptable, completely unacceptable. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you so much, Devin, for sharing that. It's so impactful and I'm so glad you were able to join us here today. And I wanna pivot now to, to the wonderful folks that joined us for this training today to see if anyone has any questions for Devin about his experiences, his knowledge, um, the workings of the ledge. Um, Please don't be shy, y'all. Please don't be shy. Use, utilize this time, get in the chat. I'm an open book. You can ask anybody. I'm going to give it to you, um, you know, 100 at all times. So please don't be shy. Um, you know, there we go. I see a hand. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. And I really resonated with the whole thing about um, missing that tribe to have that support. My question to you is, how did it feel to be running? Because I know you had the motivation there of your daughters and, and to make a better life for them, but was it scary? Was it challenging? Were you like, I'm young, what, uh, what am I gonna face? Just how did it feel? Because that's something I'm considering for the future. Yeah, um, so well, first of all, great question. And I'm glad that you're giving it thought. You know, I think all of us had to consider we all have to consider in which way we're gonna serve. Some of us can serve as elected officials, some of us can serve in other capacities, but the point is as long as you serve, um, you know, I, that, that's fundamental. That's fundamental just being a good human, a good citizen, um, a good neighbor. You know, I truly believe, you know, the old quote that Muhammad Ali said, the service is giving back and service is how we pay rent for our time here on this planet. So um, all that to say, running is not easy. Running is not easy. It is difficult. Um, you know, you have to strategize. You got to put a team around you. You personally have to be ready. You personally have to be ready uh, for all your business to be out in the open, right? Um, you know, you kind of have to be ready to get attacked um, for doing the right thing, uh, for saying the right things. As I mentioned, you're never going to please everybody. So when you decide to run for office, Many people will confide in others, but you know what? This is a very personal decision because you're the one who's gonna have your name on those signs. You're the one who's gonna have your name on the literature. You're the one that people might drag through the mud. So it's a very personal decision. My advice is always to do the research um, on what position you wanna run in. Um, you know, ask other folks, network with other folks who've ran campaigns, uh, but more importantly, develop your why. Why are you choosing to run? You know, so many people I know want to run because they have big aspirations of getting to this position and that position. And after this position, I'm going to do that. But you know what? I like to just narrow down the focus. What is it you actually want to accomplish for the community you're asking to serve? Like serving is not. This isn't this isn't, you know, um, this isn't, you know, a, a high school version of student council. These are people's lives that you have that you have in your hands that the decisions you make are going to impact them for a very long time. So this is a, this, these are very serious opportunities that one cannot just be like, well, I'm going to run to run. No, you can't just run to run. <laughs> you owe it to the people to do the research um, and, to, and to ensure that you're ready yourself for this type of responsibility, because it is heavy. Um, it is heavy. And um, so but I felt comfortable running for school board because prior to running, I was a community organizer. I, I talked to folks. I worked with students. Um, I worked with families. Uh, I was trained on how to share my story. Actually, that opportunity allowed me to roll my sleeves up and get dirty before even going to the people and asking them to consider me to represent them. So I always feel that if you're those who want to get involved, go volunteer first. Go volunteer first. Work on other campaigns, network with other candidates, and then that'll give you a real taste for if you really want to do this work. 
you know, um, some people like to just jump in without doing anything. Oh, I'm running. Have you ever knocked on the door? You know, do you know what a canvas is? Do you know, do you, you know, and I'm not saying that's a requirement, but I just, that's just my recommendation for having a great foundation before you go and decide to commit to do something. But the great question. Thank you so much. And thank you for a really thoughtful answer. Thank you, Max Ochil. I see a question in the chat here. Any advice for advocacy organizations meeting freshman representatives? Yeah. Um, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And a lot of those represent a lot of those representatives that are freshmen don't know a thing, a thing. A lot of them are not subject matter experts in your specific area. So the more you can educate, the more you can just kind of um, and I would say I would approach it. For, first of all, you know, relationships are key. Um, and, and if they're freshmen, the more you could do to be an, um, an asset to them by providing them with information regarding your said cause, I think the better off you're going to be long term as they continue to move on, you know, from freshmen to sophomore, et cetera. So I would say be the resource that they can lean on for whatever issue it is that your organization is advocating for. Let them know that you're there to help them be successful uh, in their efforts in serving the community. That's how I would approach it. Um, I consult right now for the Arizona School Board Association. I'm their advocacy and strategic initiatives consultant. And that's what I do. I lean on my relationships and I offer my experience as an asset to them to help them accomplish their goals, their goals, which again, should be tied into serving a community. Um, and that's another thing I wanted to mention, too, is sometimes you might be a little intimidated or afraid to talk to these people, but don't forget, they work for you. You're their boss. Even if they're not your representative, guess what? They're your boss. I can't tell you, I've had a lot of people who don't even live in my district who would ask me stuff, but I would still do my best to get them the answers they need or connect them with the representatives if they weren't getting the service that they felt they deserved. So remember, these people work for you. Don't be afraid to talk to these folks. Don't be afraid to send an email call their office, set up an appointment. Um, they're just regular people like us. There's no difference. There's no difference. So um, remember, at the end of the day, they can't be there without you, without your vote. Thank you so much, Devin. And I see we have a hand raised by Melissa Santiago. Hi, thank you so much for your time. So as somebody who is starting to get into more community and giving back, what type of advice do you have for people networking and organizations we should be reaching out? And just how did you find that network? Dang, great question, Melissa. As I mentioned, um, networking is key. Relationships is everything. Um, go into it, just open to, 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 to just being out there. You know, if you see an opportunity and they're looking for people to go out and volunteer for a said cause or canvas, go out there and do it. Meet folks. Um, I know people who moved here from out of state, didn't know anybody, but it would attend volunteer events on campaigns and now they have friends, lifelong friends. So the more you can get out there, the better. And I always say this, Melissa, think about this. You're the average of the five people you hang out with, okay? So if this is the work you wanna get into, volunteering, civic engagement, et cetera, make sure your crew is kind of, you know, make sure your crew is, is somewhat of a nucleus of the people you hang around with because those people you hang around with will then propel, propel you towards where you wanna be. Um, and so, and as you start to come around more at these events, and I'm talking about canvases, debates, whatever it is, just show up and introduce yourself. That's the best thing you can do. Um, that's how I got started. As I mentioned, I hopped online and looked up literally like how to get involved. And I found this group, um, back then who was working on a city councilman's race. His name is Danny Valenzuela. He's no longer councilman, but he was a councilman for uh, Phoenix, ran for mayor and lost. And um, there was this team called Team Awesome. And these folks are all now doing great things. And BD and Tony and all these great people are doing great things. But that was actually, I first learned how to canvas with that group back in 2010, 2011. That was my first exposure. And I wouldn't have had that had I not just signed up for their event, just volunteered. And I literally just showed up. I didn't know what a canvas was. I thought it was a minivan or something. I, I mean, I had no idea what was going on. You know, they had me knocking on doors, but I fell in love with it. So again, just go out there. Don't be afraid. Introduce yourself. 
Um, you know, your network is everything. So type is not about what you know, it's about who you know. There are people on this call right now that I've known for years. Um, and they can tell you in the chat, I've known for years. And we've all helped each other as we progress with different things that we've been working on. So. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Ooh, these are great questions. I appreciate this. I love the back and forth. I don't, I don't like lectures. I see we have a question from Valeria Behar. What is your experience ad slash advice when it comes to organizing movements of multiracial, multi-generational communities? Wow, that's a big one. Um, when it comes to organizing movements of multi-racial, multi-generation. First of all, my advice is do the self work that you need to check any bias you have. Let me repeat, do the self work to check all any bias you might have. And we all have biases, but you have to do the self work. That's the most important work um, to address those biases in order to have a successful multiracial and multi-generational movement. I could tell you right now, I've been a part of movement. So where I felt out, I, I have felt out, I have felt left out culturally. So <clears throat> yes, I'm African American, but I'm actually what I tell people, I gotta update my bio. I identify myself as a black again. I, I'm half black and half Mexican. My dad's Mexican, my mom's black. That's how I identify. I, I acknowledge both of my ethnicities and I'm really blessed to have the best of both worlds. But there are times when I was first getting started where I felt left out of the movement. I didn't feel included with amongst my peers. And so my advice would be if you if you want to prevent people from feeling that way, then you got to check your biases and educate yourself. Don't think you have all the answers, you know, do the work. Um, and if someone, you know, uh, educates you, uh, tries to educate you on 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 whatever it is, be open to it and be respectful. It's really simple, y'all. It's not rocket science. Be respectful, be open uh, and check your biases because uh, we all have them. But that would be my recommendation to having a successful uh, multi-generational, multi-racial movement. Thank you. Yeah, so Ronnie, that's true. That's true, Ronnie. I see your comment. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. I'm not going to lie. I've experienced that 100%. Mm -hmm. and that's a, listen, that's a whole nother conversation. So. Thank you for raising that up, Ronnie. Do we have any other questions for Devin before we give him a closing question? Dang, y'all gonna let me off easy, huh? This is cool. I see, I see a hand up. If no one else has a question, I'd like to ask another one, but I'm gonna wait a sec just to see. Okay. Um, Oh, well, he's asking if you're running for a house next year. So he's asking that first, and then I'll ask my question. Sure. Uh, to be determined. To be determined. Right now, it's not on the table. Um, I do have other interests <laughs> that are still tied into to, to, to developing a community. See, now here's another thing, too. Politics isn't the only way to affect change in a community. That's just one avenue. Right. Um, and so for me, I do have other interests that I definitely want to explore. Um, but to be 100% honest, it's not really on the table. Um, but am I, is that door closed? No. No, it's not closed. So still kind of working through it. We'll see where we end up. Dom. So my question is, what was the thing that you found most challenging while working at the ledge? And then what did you find to be the most effective strategy, both as a legislator, but also as someone, even like right now maybe, who has to go lobby um, for uh, the school boards? Okay, so I'll take it piece by piece. The first portion of your question, what was the most um, challenging you said? I think complacency. You'd be surprised how many people get jaded from being there and, and, and just dealing with the frustration of not being able to enact the change that they would they that they ran on, it's easy to get jaded. And that leads to sometimes folks being complacent. And when you're complacent, you're not working. And when you're not working, then 
you know, you're not, you're not doing what you need to do. So um, I was only there for a very short time, but I made the most of it. I don't care. You put me somewhere for five minutes. I'm using all, I'm using all five minutes, um, you know, and, and I dropped bills. I had meetings, I had press conferences. I had ceremonies. I did the most, but there were some people who were tapped out. They were already ready to go. They were just like, I'm done. Not more I can do. And it's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Until that second Monday of the next session, you're still representative. You have an obligation. You have an obligation to still serve these people. You are drawing a little bit of paycheck. Now, don't be wrong. You don't get paid nothing. It's pennies, pennies. It's pennies. You know, it's, it's, it, may, it might be enough for gas money and a cookie, but it's pennies. Um, but you're still there. So that was, for me, that was the most frustrating part is seeing people get jaded, seeing complacency. And, I'm, you know, I speak for, I give it to both sides equally. Complacency is not just, you know, it's, it's, it affects both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans. You know, I told you I was going to keep it real. So complacency is not just immune to one political party. That was the most challenging thing. Um, oh, and then wait, wait, one more, one more frustrating moment that I've experienced, that I experienced during my time there was <sighs> a lot of folks are afraid to think out of the bots or just get rid of the bots in general. Remember what I said, this isn't rocket science. A lot of it's people science. And there are some times that I think folks get disconnected and they let the title go to their head and they forget what they're there for. And, um, you know, when you're there, you have a bunch of lobbyists with deep pockets. They hype you up. They, they make you feel like you're the smartest person in the world. But see me, you can't run game on me. I already knew what the game was. You weren't going to hype me up. I already knew. And I'm not new to this. I've been doing this for years. But there's a lot of people, especially freshmen, I always warn freshmen, like, look, don't come in here falling for the okie doke because they're going to run game on you, having you think that you're the next Barack Obama or AOC. Stop. Learn the system. Learn the game. Do what you have to do. And remember why you're here. OK. Um, and then I'm sorry. What was the second part of your question? Sorry. What do you find the most effective strategy, either as a legislator um, or as someone lobbying legislators um, to achieve the change you want? Yeah. <clears throat> Arm yourself with all the facts and knowledge. I know we live in a society where sometimes facts don't, facts don't feel like they matter anymore, but they do. They do. Arm yourself with the knowledge. Learn how to use the art of storytelling. Because when you go and testify on behalf of these bills, it's these stories that sometimes can move or shift the narrative. Um, so understanding the art of storytelling, arming yourself with the facts and knowledge, and then giving that, giving that to those representatives. Because again, they're not subject matter experts. So if you can arm them with the resources and tools, the better off they're going to be. And also the other half of that is when the representatives do something good, acknowledge that. So you want to reward good behavior. So if they vote on a bill that you were in support of or whatever that is, send them a thank you note, um, email, call, text. Thank you. Just sign it saying thank you. Those thank yous go a long way because believe it or not, they don't get a lot of them. So lean into that, right? Reward good behavior, but also keep the bad behavior in check, right? In that RTS system, I hope whoever, so if you don't have, if you're not signed up for RTS, sign up for RTS. We use that all the time, um, you know, as, as a means to show force, especially someone mentioned for those in the rural areas who can't always come down. It's a great tool. I've sat in on committee hearings where uh, representatives will pull up the RTS list and say, hey, we've had three people sign in that said they're against this. And here's kind of the theme I'm seeing. So it is a tool that some representatives will utilize to, you know, make their point on the bill. So it is helpful. So requests to speak, emails, texts, all of that works. All that is a good form of advocacy, right? Um, so, I mean, um, and again, remember, these people are just human too. They're human too. So understanding, like I said, when they do something well, shoot them a thank you. When they don't, hold them accountable, but don't blow up the spot. Sometimes people want to just get a, um, you know, they want to blow up the spot, throw a grenade. But really, throwing grenades doesn't really get you anywhere. In fact, in fact, what I've seen it do to some representatives is they then retreat and they become recluse. And now you don't have any line of communication with them. So 
I think there's, there's again, there, there's a strategy involved. There's a time and a place for everything, right? But again, I think you get farther sometimes, you know, um, by just being genuine and trying to have a decent relationship, open line of communication with these folks. Gracias. De nada. Anyone else, y'all? I have a question real quick. Hi, it's Tanya Tolleson, Avondale, West Phoenix represents. Uh, thank you so much for running Tolleson Union High. My sister goes to West Point and that school is amazing. So thank you so much. Uh, my question is because I do wanna get the courage to use the request to speak. What is your advice in like getting the courage to do that? Because it is so scary. I've, I've done like, city council and like it is so scary <laughs> well donnie remember request to speak you're just writing your position you're writing in your position if you're for or against it and you can add a comment so it's not too scary um now if you go and testify in person i get yes, it it's nerve it. oh that's what you're talking about okay that's it sorry so, okay <laughs> that's what you're talking about okay yeah. yeah so testifying in person you're right it can be scary, it can be intimidating. Public speaking in general is a natural thing <laughs> that people have to work through, right? That's one of the greatest fears is public speaking. So I, I definitely hear what you're saying. I definitely hear what you're saying. My advice would be is just to practice. Practice, practice, practice. Get your talking points down. If you have to read off a note card, that's okay. And remember, these representatives aren't gonna grill you while you're up there and be like, how dare you? Or, or you know, they're not gonna be like, well, you know, uh, it's not gonna be a back and forth debate everyone's given a time limit. You're allowed to say your piece and you step off that podium. Now, sometimes they might say a little smart remark, but they, at that point it's done. You can't really clap back in that moment. So you could go to the podium, say your piece and walk away. Um, but yeah, just stay prepared with your talking points, um, no cards, you know. And again, if you've already done student counts and all these other things, it's no different. Remember, you're the boss. These people work from you. Taxpayer dollars fund those little salaries at the end of the day. So would you be, if you were the boss at work, would you be afraid to talk to your employee? Probably not. So we have to start viewing these people as employees. <laughs> we have to just start, you know, you're the boss. You know what I mean? You're the team leader. Yes, they're there making decisions, but they're there on behalf of the people. Don't forget the constitution that they swore on, the oath, the preamble, we the people, the preamble of the Constitution, like we the people, not we the representatives, we the we the elected officials. No, it's we the people, the people meaning you. Therefore, understand that this is your house. The House of Representatives belongs to you, the people. Same with the Senate. So, you know, don't be afraid to pull up and and, and let your opinion be known. Thank you so much, Devin. I see we're at six, but I know we have one more question if you have the time, Devin. Um, oh, I got time today. Where are we at? <laughs> Come on. From DJ, um, how did you balance family life with work that requires so much unconventional hustle? Mm. I'm going to let you learn a little secret, DJ. There's no such thing as balance. There's no such thing as balance. I've been on a school board now for almost a decade. There's no balance. You just have to make time for the things that are important to you, period. You have to make time. If you focus on trying to find a balance, you're going to disappoint yourself and disappoint the others that care about you. So the best thing I can tell you is just to make time and understand that when you get in this work, Oh, it's a sacrifice. Someone in your life is going to miss out on your time. For me, it was my daughters. Or it could be anything. If you're in a relationship and you get into politics, you better make sure your partner is understanding that it's going to be some long nights, long weeks, and you might not get to have that late night Netflix movie binge, or you not, may not get to you know, go to the family fiesta on the weekend. Like Those are some very real things that you should consider when you're getting ready to run for office. Because best believe there will be some sacrificing going on for the greater good, right? Um, but that that was the biggest thing for me was, you know, being away from my daughters um, and then really not getting it 
right? That I'm doing this for them and for other kids. And so my hope is, see, I, and so for me, I'm going to have some explaining to do to my girls. And but I don't mind that. I'm prepared for that conversation. Um, you know, and I don't miss out. First of all, I do, I do have boundaries. I don't miss birthdays. I don't miss special events. I'm always there on the first day of school. Like I don't miss big things, period. My babies come first, period. But there are times when I get home, they're already asleep, right? There are times when I wake up, I got to go, they're asleep, right? Sometimes I hit, I got to hit a meeting. They're like, daddy, again, another meeting. I'm like, yeah, you know, and that's always tough. That's always tough. But my eldest daughter, the 12 year old, I've been bringing her around since she was little. Some of you on this call know her and you've seen her around. And now she's starting to become a little, um, she's now she's starting to appreciate civic engagement and she's doing stuff at her school and focus on the environment. And so, so all this time I, I thought maybe she wasn't soaking it in, but they were, she really was. And now it's just a thing that she's doing. So again, no real balance, man. You just gotta make time. I always tell people that people always ask me, man, you're so busy. How do you have time? You know, how do you have time? I'm, I'm like, I don't have time. <laughs> I make time. Okay. I make time. I don't have time. I make time. So if I'm spending it with you, know that you're probably important because I could be spending it with my daughters, with my family, with my Nana, my Thea, my aunt, somebody else. So, um, you know, again, that's why I always say, if you, this is something that you choose to do, make sure you uh, take into account the sacrifices and who you're going to be sacrificing that time with. Great question, DJ. That's a really excellent question. All right, I think we got through the questions. Any last minute questions before I leave Devin with some final words? Awesome. All right, Devin, thank you so much for coming today. So many gems, so much fantastic knowledge. Really, really appreciate it. I think to close us out here, would love to hear what would you say to somebody that's thinking of running for school board, running for legislature, getting involved in their community? What would you tell them at this point in time if they're on the fence? I would say, take the time, take the time to figure out the why. Why do you wanna serve? Your why, which is basically your story, is gonna be the most powerful tool you have to move people, to, to motivate others, hell, to motivate yourself. Figure out your why. Because if you don't know why you wanna run for office, how can you expect others to support you? So figuring out that why, figuring out what your purpose is. And again, folks, this, these, these are hard questions to ask. Um, these aren't easy, you know, you're not gonna just answer these overnight, right? Um, but you gotta have that conversation with yourself. Um, figure out your why, figure out your story, figure out what that purpose is. And that will help you figure out what the next steps are. But know that there are awesome organizations like Instituto and other organizations that can help you with resources, connect you with people, if you choose to go down that route. Um, I myself have mentored a lot of people and try to help out wherever I can. Um, I'll meet with you. You want to have coffee. I'll talk to you about it. And I'm going to keep it real with you. I'm not going to give you the answer you want to hear. I'm going to tell them to keep it real with you because I care enough and I understand what it takes to do this and be very and be successful at it. Not just sit here, smile, talk, look pretty. No, be successful and have receipts of work that you can point to years down the line and say, hey, you know what? I made a difference. And all the time that I sacrificed, it was definitely worth it. So for me, I don't regret uh, my decision to run for school board or anything else. Um, it was one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life. And I don't regret not one bit. Having the honor to serve is one of the most um, patriotic things you can do is to serve others. So if that's where your heart's at, go for it. Go for it. But just make sure that you want to do it. Make sure your, your heart is telling you, you want to do it. And that's what I would say. Um, so again, um, I'm here. If you ever want to uh, chat, if you ever want to strategize, let me know. Um, and I'm happy to lean in, but, uh, you you are needed. We need more people that look like us and that are allies st sitting at these tables. Cause y'all know the same. Y'all know the same. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu and that's real. 
So um, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me this evening. I appreciate y'all. Yeah, thank you so much, Devin. And before you all jump, <laughs> um, we do ask that you provide some feedback. You know, what did you love about Devin's portion? What did you love about the training portion? Um, just, you know, what also do you want to learn more about, about the legislature? There's so much more to it, right, than what we covered today. Um, so let us know, you know, what we didn't cover that you want to see in a future training, um, what your org needs, what you need, and I'll make sure, you know, once we finish the toolkit that gets out to all of you, as well as with, you know, Devin's Instagram handle and yeah, reach out if you need anything. And thank you again, Devin. Really, really appreciate, you know, everything you've offered folks tonight. Um, really appreciative. And I'll just play some music, let folks finish up their survey and have a wonderful Taco Tuesday. Si es casualidad que yo me sienta así Siempre que tú estás cerquita de mí Dime qué me hiciste, qué droga me diste Que desde aquella noche no soy igual Tú me miras y empiezo a sudar Siento que puedo volar Baby, la noche Ese totito es la eminencia Pa' darle tengo licencia Desde que fuimos a Florencia Se puso más picha Pero no pierde la esencia No, no, de Carola No, 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 anda sola No, 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 le diga hola O va a hacer otro pa' la cola Tu pique te me mola Yo soy fan de esa popola Me la pique y la endo La coque y la rola Ahora tú quien me controla Veo el mal, mami, llévame en tu ola Hoy me siento bien puta, repiola Ey, pa'l que la nota Ya está haciendo efecto Mi mundo está día Y me siento perfecto Porque está tú aquí All right. Have a good night, everybody.